analyzing formative evaluation data and revising, revising, and revising by Katherine P. Fulford, Professor, Learning Design and Technology, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Part 1. The first thing you want to do with your data is look from all angles. So step 1 is to display and analyze your data. We're going to use visual tools, tables and graphs, also known as figures, as well as numerical data. You can use frequencies or percentages for 10 or more subjects. It's good to use this format for both frequencies and percentages together. 9 is the number of people and the percentage is 90. I'm going to go through the following figures and tables with you. The table of individual scores by item, a bar graph of test data by item, a line graph of test data by objective, an instructional analysis chart with pre- and post-test scores, demographic survey with summary statistics, an attitude survey with summary statistics, and a table of revisions by component. We're going to start with a table of individual scores by item. First of all, look at the bottom summaries. This will give you your objective and item data. It'll show you how each item or objective performed across all participants. It helps determine item difficulty and helps show the item consistency between the pre-embedded and post-test. Next, your left-hand summaries gives you the learner data. It shows how each participant performed across objectives. Make sure, though, that you eliminate any poor items you discovered from your first analysis of the bottom summaries. It shows if some participants did exceptionally well or poorly, and this can be compared with your entry behavior test and your demographics. Check the item completion and you may eliminate a single outlier if necessary. What an outlier is, is somebody who did extremely well or extremely poorly and doesn't seem to be a part of your target population. You can only have one, though. The idea is that if you have more than one, they may be a part of your population. And if you have one at the high end and one at the low end, they cancel each other out. The middle section shows each item's test scores. First, it lists each student's number down the side so that it shows the total number of students. It labels each test across the top and provides a score for each test item. Zero is usually used as incorrect, while one is correct. We'll see other versions later. Let's see if you can analyze the data. Take out a piece of paper, then pause the video and look carefully at each figure before I give my explanation. Write down what you think the data tells you. What is good or wrong with the figure? Let's start with our table of individual scores by item that I've just described. Okay, remember we start with the bottom. These pretest items are too easy or should be entry behaviors. If you notice, only three students or 77% miss the test items. So you should go back and look at the items and look at the demographics and see what the problem is. Next is our right side. Three students seem to match the target population based on the pretest numbers. This participant either struggled or didn't answer some of the items. You want to see if you can figure out why. There's also a large drop on the embedded item for two individuals. Go back and look at the individual data and see if you can discover what happened. Perhaps they forgot to answer these questions. Okay, let's look at the middle. In blue, you can see the items that were incorrect. These students miss the pretest, but that's okay. Missing pretest items is clearly expected of the population. Also, missing a few post test items is not unusual because you would expect that they might forget some things. Although, if you have missed embedded items, you really need to take a look because the embedded items are right after the instruction, and especially when their pretest was correct, it may indicate that there's an item problem or an unanswered item. Okay, here's another way of doing this table. This one has an item analysis. In other words, what they're looking at is exactly what distractor was chosen by each student. Here we have the answer key that tells you what is correct for each item. The problem is, using numbers in two different ways and letters is confusing. 
Notice that they've highlighted the cells for you to see what's incorrect, but they made a mistake because not all of the incorrect items are highlighted. These letters should indicate pre-embedded and final test, but they've got the column in the wrong place, and there's no legend to tell what these are for. This one is nice because they've already annotated it for you, so they show you exactly what you should be looking at and what was wrong. Okay, let's look at our next table. This one is for entry-level items. So they did an item analysis here on eight different entry behaviors. It would have been better since they were comparing two groups, though, to use zeros and ones. If you look at the scores, there are some clear differences between the two groups. As I recall, one group was in a grade earlier than the other one, except for this one item. So you probably want to take a look at that item and see why the older group had issues with it. Ooh, these colors are way too bright and the contrast is very low. It's hard to read. Looks like an Easter egg to me. Though there is a good legend that has the number of students. That's helpful. Take a look at this bar graph of individual scores by item. It's clean, clear, and simple. Although it's missing the number of participants, this should always be in every figure, in every graph, in every table. Note here, item 10 and 13.1 have very high pretest scores. You need to take a look at that. Ooh, this one is also tough. It's nice to have the annotations of anomalies, but the yellow is too bright and it makes it hard to read, hard to look at. There is a lot of data for one graph it would probably be better to split this into two so that the bars are not so thin. This one is also missing the number of participants. And notice it uses percentages, and remember you should use frequencies for less than 10 people. You should also put less data on one figure, again, so that the bars are not too small. One thing that you could do is move the entry behaviors to a separate table. If you have long labels like this, you can turn your graph horizontally. Let's take a look. Here's a different bar graph with individual scores by item, but it's coming from your left-hand side to your right. It works nicely for long labels. But in this case, these could have been a lot more descriptive. You could have had specifically what each of those behaviors are. The problem is, is they've got you reading the behaviors upward, and it's very confusing to figure out what the post-test is and what the pre-test is as well as what order it goes in. Take a look at number one, four, and nine. These have problems that you need to solve. Yikes, this is just too hard to look at. The Easter Bunny has struck again. This is a nice line graph of individual scores by item. It's very easy to read. Ooh, but what happened to this final pretest item? As I seem to recall, it was too easy. Again, we've been gifted with having annotations. That really is nice. And the yellow works in this case because it's easier to see the post-test. Just take a look and see what some of these issues were. There are some sloppy errors on this one. Take a look at these two boxes. It might be good to put your entry level in a different figure to spread this out a little bit more so that it's easier to read. There are a lot of issues with these results, but you need a legend to be able to figure it out. As I recall, the post-test was harder. You have to be careful or you shoot yourself in the foot. Always make sure your items are parallel. This is an instructional analysis chart with pre- and post-test scores. It allows you to take a look at how accurate your hierarchy chart is. On the ideal hierarchy, we expect the higher scores at the bottom moving to lower scores at the top on the pretest. By the time you move to field trials, well-polished instruction would have post-test scores over 80. Let's take a look. These entry-level items are not very high. Were they poor items, or do we need these objectives in our instruction? There are some very high pretest scores. Are they too easy, or are they entry behaviors? Notice a lot of these scores for the post-test are very low. We have to ask ourselves, do we need to change the instruction, provide more practice, or are they just poor test items? Or perhaps the sample doesn't match the audience. You really have to be a detective to figure out what's wrong. 
a lot of times people will default to it's just a poor test item when that may not always be the case. You need to do a thorough examination and a thorough analysis to figure out what happened. Okay, here's another instructional analysis chart. This is a nice idea for the legend and boxes to color code it. Notice the green items are ones with a positive growth, yellow had no growth, and red had negative growth. These five items are in yellow. There was no growth, and for four of them, they're all 100, and the other 91. You have to discover, were they too easy? Should they actually be entry-level behaviors? The greens mostly performed well, but missing the number of students, it's difficult to interpret. You could only have a few students. Remember, you should not be using percentages for numbers below 10. This last terminal objective, the pretest did as expected, but the post-test at 64 is probably not what you'd like. So the question is, do you just need more practice? Do you need more instruction? What is it that you need to get this score up? The red are those that dropped. You have to look at the difficulty level of the items and whether they were parallel or whether there was just not enough instruction to help the students learn. Listen, you might learn something. For step two, we're going to consider our demographics. Your demographic data should be linked with your test data so that you can compare it. For example, this is what you might see when you've done a good comparison. Participants rating themselves with more computer skills were more successful. Those with higher levels of anxiety with math did poorly on the calculation items. Those with less experience missed more items. Let's take a look at some demographics from these two different groups. Notice their ages are considerably different, with the second set a wider range of ages. As for level, we have only one senior, but in our set two, we not only have a senior, but we have graduate level students. If you notice, one group had never taken what's called a DMHA class, while the other group had taken one to four of these classes, which provided prerequisite information. Let's dive into some case-specific demographics for technology training. We're going to look at some differences that the researcher should check against the performance. Here we have an age range of 21 to 35, that's 14 years, so that's quite a big difference. It may make a difference in performance. This one is probably even more important, the number of years of educational technology programs. The range is 0 to 5 years. Also here, the number of educational technology courses is 0 to 16. You would expect some big differences between these students. And here, most everyone said yes, that they had created a website, and this particular person said no. That's going to be important, especially because the software being taught has to do with creating websites. Here's some more differences to check. This is a list of technology tools that people use either at school or at work, but particularly important is what's not used. Those are database, drawing software, and desktop publishing. I wonder if that's going to make a difference in those individuals' performance. Okay, here's some more differences to check. This has to do with their attitudes. Let's look at the negatives. Keep software updated. Learn through one-on-one -on -one instruction. And learn through taking a course. Ooh, all of these sound important, especially learn through one-on-one -on -one instruction. Even more important is this learn using a guide, since this is about creating a guide. Look at the number of people that are undecided. That may well make a difference as well. You should check those individuals to see how they performed. Step 3. Consider qualitative data. First you want to validate your data. Do you think it's accurate? Sometimes people make comments that are in conflict with other data you find. So, if needed, you want to eliminate those data. Once you have your data set, then you want to summarize it. Next, you want to prioritize what's important to report. Let's take a look at this survey data. It's nice to have a legend so you understand what the questions are asking. But we're missing the N. Remember to use percentages for more than 10. Also, be careful of negatively stated items. Sometimes they'll trick people into answering the wrong question. 
If you notice, a number of people answered strongly agree, although they were positive on many other items. Compare the negative and undecided scores to the individual's performance. Next, look at this survey. Again, we need to see the number of people. Notice how much easier this one is to read with blanks instead of zeros. It helps you zone in on exactly what people thought. For example, if we look at these four items, we notice that there are things in the disagree or strongly disagree category. But look, there are the negatively worded items, so one would expect that they would be in that category. But notice, one person answered in the agree category. If you notice, there are a lot of those at 10%. It's likely that somebody went down the page checking off agree. That's what you have to be careful about when you have negatively stated items check against your comments. So you want to compare these negative scores to performance. Let's take a look at the open-ended items and comment data. What you want to do is summarize it over participants. So this is several students made this comment and it said that it's nice to get immediate feedback for their responses and that being unsure of the grasp of the concepts may have affected the performance on their post-test. So you can see how this particular comment was able to be linked to their performance. Let's look at another one. Here we have a second trend. The incorrect responses reveal difficulty in determining whether the evidence met or did not meet standards. And here is a comment to show that evidence. It's nice to use comments in both your text as well as in your presentation. This is the end of part one of analyzing formative evaluation data and revising. Please continue to part two to learn more about how to revise from formative evaluation data. If you'd like further study, here's the reference for the video. Other is from my experience.